Here we go. We'll start recording. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Welcome to the Copyright and Online Learning webinar number 57. Number 57. So my name is Chris Morrison. My name's James Hecker. Um, and we are the co-chairs of the Association for Learning Technologies Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group, also known as the Cool Sig. Yes. The, the coolest gang there is in the world of uh, online learning, learning technology, and all things educational and research-based. We would say it hasn't been independently verified, <laughs> but I think all of those of you who have been in, in, involved in what we've been up to over the last couple of years would agree. Yes. It's a pretty cool place to be. So, so welcome, welcome. We've got quite a lot to get through. So I'm going to go happy back. New year. And happy, happy New Year. Happy New Year to everyone. Yes. 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 Um, First so, webinar of 2023. We've got an exciting lineup, haven't we? We do. So here we go. Friday the 13th. That doesn't necessarily... Yeah. Lucky. I think we can ignore all that superstitious Lucky. nonsense. We're going to have a good one today. Yeah. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of copyright news here, some uh, a new podcast, some new uh, events that are coming up um, and, and some cool things. But the main thing today is an interview where it's not us interviewing someone else, is it? No, it's not. No, we're being interviewed. Um, very delighted to have Luis Pereira, my colleague from City University, who is a senior lecturer in educational development, and he's going to be interviewing us about our chapter in the IFLA open access book, Navigating Copyright for Libraries. Um, purpose and scope. <laughs> I love its purpose and scope. Yep, we are going to be doing that. So, yeah, really so good. We're going to be talking about copyright education and its relationship to information literacy. Something that we've thought about. It's very a close bit. to our hearts, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, some would say obsessed. Anyway, since we last met, so what have we got here? <laughs> Things that we've been up to. Just a brief one. So, uh, should I go first? Little, what are those little dots? Should I go first? In the sea? So this was the idea. My cousin came to visit over over New Year and was like, shall we go for a New Year's Day swim? So a New Year's Day swim, all very well and good. If you turn up at the wrong time of day, mm. um, it takes a very, very long time to get to get, to to get it even up past your ankles. Yeah, so you that haven't is, got your tide timetables out, have indeed you? Indeed not. And so you end up just kind of wading out through the freezing cold estuary mud. Uh, I did kind of get in at one point, but anyway, that, that was it. <laughs> Planning to do some more open water swimming though this year. It's kind of lovely. Thing I'm do. Lovely, lovely. Yes. And you, you, you've been. Well, this like is actually the other. Cozy. This is the other corner of the room. Yes, unfortunately, I was not feeling too great over most of Christmas and New Year. Um, but I did um spend a fair bit of time necking cocktails. <laughs> no, cocktail I wasn't. Bar. I wasn't actually. But getting my cocktail bar ready so that it's ready to open when I'm. Fully, have you I'm been fully... practicing the Tom Cruise thing? That's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The ceiling's yeah. a little bit low for the spinning of the bottles. but You just sit down when you okay. do it. Right, okay. All... Yeah, yeah, or yeah. just yeah. sort of squat on the floor or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there we go. That's 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 that corner of the room, which if we could turn this camera around, everyone could see. We don't want them to see. We don't want, we don't them, want to see. them to see what we've got here. No. Um, okay, lovely. Uh, so this is a reminder that all the previous webinars, all other 50 Six. I don't think all 56 are on. No, but most record. of them are. Most of them are. Some of them have been closed. Some of them we've prioritised the, the uploading to the YouTube channel. But in fact, there's, there's fantastic content. And yeah, thanks to all the guests that have joined us so far and made it such a, an excellent series. Um, so we are on to... <laughs> Seamless. Copyright news. It is copyright news. So the first one is well done. I should say well done for having persevered through the editing of a podcast. This is the first of the Copyright Waffle podcast that Jane has edited. Very um, grateful to my colleague at City, um, yeah. Emma, who helped me. Um, I did some podcast editing training with her before Christmas mm -hmm. and sort of slightly tore my hair out with audacity a little bit, but yes, got there in the end. Uh, but this is such a great one because we're talking to Tanya Todorova, uh, as we would describe, I've described her as the godmother of copyright literacy. Yes. It was her that started the international project that Jane and I first got involved in that started us on 
the kind copyright, of the, like, copyright literacy journey. The journey. The, the journey. journey. And yeah. this journey took us to Sophia, where we spoke to her yes. um, so about this was her background. Recorded mainly, actually. Um, on location. On location, yes. So some of it's recorded at Luton Airport. <laughs> That's the <laughs> highlight. It is. It really, it really was um, a fantastic place. And it's a very short podcast as well. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a holiday special. Not yeah. that we were on holiday, of course. We no, were, no, we no, no. Hard. No, but um, um, yeah. And, and, and the people will find it entertaining. And the other thing to say, and also the work that you've been putting in over this period where you've been slightly locked down, is that you've actually worked out how to get it onto Spotify. Yes. And and, and to say thank you very much for that. Because, yes, um, yes. Lewis, are you able to pop the links in the chat for any of these? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Now on Spotify. So if that is your favourite oh, yeah, platform brilliant. for thank podcasts you and yeah. you haven't checked out Copyright <laughs> Waffle, please do. There's a whole bunch more coming through in the pipeline. There's some, there's mm. some good stuff. Mm. Uh, We're getting some interesting analytics as well about we the 16 people that have listened to our podcast on Spotify so far. <laughs> I'll start somewhere. Right. Uh, the next uh, is um, a piece is an article, which is uh, uh, Lieber. Um, so Ben White, uh, who who is part of the, the Lieber um, copyright and, and related rights group, has has written this article um, because there's uh, analysis from and which country is it that we're talking? It's about? Finland. Finland. Yeah. Um, where they've been looking at the fundamental right to education and science and how there is this conflict between what copyright law says and those restrictive rights and sort of more broadly how how can we support access? And it's related to the implementation of the digital single market yes, um, EU directive in and, Finland. So, and again, yeah. related to the Knowledge Rights 21 program yeah. that, that Libra are involved with. So uh, interesting uh, piece there to, Definitely. to look at what's happening. Watch this space of what's happening in Finland. This is an interesting article as well that came out, I think, uh, just before um, the break. Um, this is written by um, Lisa Hinchliffe and a, a couple of other authors as well, but it's based on some work that she actually presented um, at Ice Pops in 2019. 2019 in I Edinburgh, think. if you were there, yes. you will remember the, the session she had. She was capturing stuff from, from that group as well to, that fed she into She was, this. yes. So it is about um, copyright education and um, the role that library associations around the world play in sort of supporting um you know uh, understanding of copyright you know there's some interesting um conclusions there about patterns around the world and how that how that varies and and what is needed as well and how important copyright is so yeah good good article worth having a look at um so the next one is new year doesn't just mean cold water swimming and cocktails it also means <laughs> in the copyright world that there is a whole group or a certain you know um uh catalogues of work certain um authors creators who because of the date of their death their work has passed into the public domain mm. so uh this public domain date is, is quite a lot of it is us focused because there are differences depending on which country you're in which jurisdiction you're looking at but uh fritz lang's metropolis is mentioned here mm. um so if you want to check that out these are works that no longer have copyright protection so can be reused without the need for permission and there's been some interesting um postings as well as well about um the changes to canadian copyright mm -hmm. law that we reported just before christmas meaning that actually there isn't any works i think there was because they previously had a 50-year um copyright protection um there would have been a whole host of works i think including tolkien's work that would have gone into yeah. the public domain in canada but obviously now hasn't because they've extended the duration of copyright to life plus 70. Mm. So int yeah, interesting stuff on uh, stuff on lots of blogs actually yeah. about Public Domain Day 2023. Next one, yes. Um, so uh, this was a, a, a piece that been, has been published, a sort of call to action from Creative Commons um, around um, global op open culture. And it's um, aimed particularly at policymakers. Um, so you, have a look at the link on that one. Um, yeah. We're often following work that, that and lobbying work that Creative Commons are doing. Um, and obviously this sort of builds on some of the things we talked about last year at Ice Pops um, in Doug and Andrew's keynote about the kind of whole open glam movement and access to, um, yeah, culture. So that's a, just an interesting um, advocacy piece that, that Creative Commons have done recently. Absolutely. Thought that was worth highlighting. Uh, 
And the final news item here is uh, a Twitter thread that um, I first uh, picked up on because Charles Oppenheim tweeted it. And it's actually um, the person who wrote the poem that comes at the end of Minecraft. If you didn't know Minecraft had an end, did you? No, I you didn't. You just thought it was just wandering around chopping down trees and uh, yeah. building things and running away from scary monsters. Yeah. Uh, I think it is largely that. But, yeah. But there is a game that you can play. And this is a copyright um, element to this because uh, the, he wrote it for the, um, to the developer when it was an independent game. And then subsequently that was acquired by Microsoft. Um, and this is the author of that poem has decided to dedicate it to the commons mm. as part of a sort of public declaration of um, their own uh, desire to do that but also it's a really interesting reflection on what happens when you have a legal situation with a, a, a large uh, corporate multinational organization uh, claiming or not even necessarily explicitly asserting the rights in something that you have created mm. and what's the interplay between it's like an individual creator someone who's done something and then um, something that is such a sort of multi-billion dollar industry right so, interesting thread there that I thought you might be interested in following up if you do it's also useful to have examples of kind of how things play out in practice mm. when you're doing your teaching around copyright and I thought this was a good one because he talks very much about actually in this case Microsoft is silent they're not responding and it's that sort of the fear that comes from well what if they did take legal action mm. so just thought that would be useful yeah 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 thank you Lewis putting all our links in so Without further ado. So we're returning to. <clears throat> yes, here we have um, the book. I have it on my knee in front we'll of us. In a moment, the hard we'll, copy in book. a moment, we'll get rid of the slides so everyone can actually see us rather yes. than just yes. the, the, the book. But yes, yeah, chapter 13 is the one. We're going to get into that in a moment. 13th on the th th chapter 13 on the 13th. What could go wrong? Exactly. Um, so we're delighted to, to thank uh, Lewis for joining us. Lewis is also a senior in education development at City, um, works alongside you, but he's got some uh, really great insights from his background in, in, in media um, and information literacy as well. So we're looking forward to this very much. Yes, we are. Um, definitely. And that's that's us. We introduced ourselves at the outset, but yeah. just for those, if anybody doesn't know us, uh, the copyright and licensing specialist at the Bodleian Libraries at the University of Oxford. Yes, and I'm a senior lecturer um, at City University, and I'm also the programme director of our Masters in Academic Practice. So, okay, uh, so hello, Lewis, welcome. Hi, Jane. Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining the session today. And uh, uh, Chris and Jane, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this webinar, and thanks for inviting me to interview both. Uh, it's quite a responsibility and <laughs> I know it's it's a cliche but I believe this will be more of a conversation or discussion than um, a formal interview obviously um, I have to say I did enjoy reading your chapter so very well done uh, both of you and I guess my he call it a PhD viva didn't he the other day well I said oh, is this going to be a viva I'll yeah, be I'm happy, happy, happy to, to do that but entirely up to you and then you have, you have the chapter in front of you which might I do <laughs> yeah oh gosh draw your attention to page 120 he's going to point out the typos <laughs> I guess my first uh, question and might be of interest for everyone here is about the motivation the reasons not only to write this uh, chapter, but also how you got involved with the topics you talk about in this chapter. Okay. Shall we start? Shall I start? Shall I start? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try and keep it a brief answer because I think quite a lot of people probably do know some of this. And actually, it is. I do mention it in the uh, the podcast um, with Tanya Todorova. So I, a lot of people know. Um, my background, I worked for a long time at LSE, London School of Economics, and um, I had sort of two main roles, one of which was providing um, copyright advice and guidance for staff and for students, and another role that was around developing um, actually online information literacy and working with the library team. And for quite some time, I didn't really see that the two parts of my job were really, I mean, I knew they were related at a high level, but I didn't see there was a direct relationship between the two things um, until um, in, um, I think it was 20, um, 
2016 when I was at the European Conference of Information Literacy and ended up um, in a session where Tanya Todd Rover was speaking about some research she'd done um, about what she called copyright literacy and she was talking about the survey results and talking about how copyright kind of fit in this sort of broader understanding of information literacy and I think that for me was sort of quite a, a, a light bulb moment because as I say up until then I'd been not necessarily seeing the two things that I did as particularly interlinked I was really involved in information literacy and in the information literacy group um, and I knew that lots of people that I would talk to that were information literacy experts would kind of go oh yeah yeah that's copyright I try to avoid that really we have a specialist that deals with it so I I, I was kind of aware um, that I was relatively unique in sort of working in those two areas and I think one of the things that for me I wanted to do in writing this chapter was to try to explain how the two areas are really very interlinked and and you know I think once once that had been kind of made clear to me once I'd seen that um, back in 2014 and Chris and I did the research into levels of understanding and copyright literacy amongst librarians it, it kind of I don't know lots of lots of things fell into place I think for me um, and yeah so I, I kind of I felt like that the chapter was a really good opportunity to try to consolidate a lot of the things I've been mm. thinking about since mm. since that little light bulb moment so yeah um, we've got a light bulb that's not working. We've got a light bulb, exactly. We bought some new lights today. And anyway, that's by the way. But you might want to say a bit about how we got involved in writing the yeah. the chapter in the book as well. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm reflecting on the fact that my background prior to working in education and in libraries was working within the creative industries. So I worked for uh, a music collecting society called PRS for Music. So I saw things very much from the rights holder perspective and when it came to talking about copyright education the the industry the creative industries music film gaming whatever they 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 have a different perspective on that than than educators and, and librarians um and i want you know, since we've been working together in this area um clearly there's it's a difficult subject to teach copyright in some ways because uh, it's complexity and some of the things we, we pick up in in the chapter and explain mm. sort of why that is and and so people want to see it something that's quite clear and rigid that they can get a handle on and in fact often it isn't mm. um, and there are sort of broader reasons why so but I think when we were writing this uh, I kind of wanted it to be the some of those tensions between those things really want to sort of get it out and have this encompassing well what is it that we've been talking about i mean is copyright literacy really a thing and i think mm -hmm. we went into the chapter we went quite deep into it didn't mm. we? back and forth and, and there were several <laughs> several redrafts i think it's quite different from where it started off yeah definitely. because it was it was quite an, an involved process wasn't it it was it was yeah yeah and most of the writing we actually did um around the end of last year didn't we i think the end of the year before last end of 2021 oh right yes it was even longer ago than that yes it's taken a long because well, it's now 2023 yes yes yeah yeah no you're right mm -hmm. i just remember it was quite painful writing it over that christmas break and doing a lot of redrafting and mm -hmm. and then we had a whole process where it went off with a peer review but I mean, we, you know, we know people who work at IFNA and we were really delighted they invited us, yeah. I think. To, they, they are. That's a, uh, really a great context and background about your interests. And uh, it's also interesting to, to know a bit more about uh, the writing process, because I can imagine a very intense discussion around these concepts and also self-reflection about your own mm. context and what you have been doing over the last years. Um, in, in your chapter, you say uh, that copyright is a highly contested space. Um, mm. That sense, and uh, Chris somehow was already uh, alluding to this, how, how can you create a copyright education or a copyright literacy field? Or is that a thing? Um, what are the challenges, basically? Mm. Yeah, I think 
it's an interesting one because in some ways i think we are describing things that uh, already are in place there already are communities of copyright educators particularly coming from the library field who are already providing this kind of uh, critical reflection on it so we aren't necessarily so much saying there needs to be a new thing that needs to be created we reflect on the fact that there is that it was more the recognition of what it is that's going on so we, we give some some case studies of our approach to it mm. um and part of it is these webinars and what we've been doing here um but i i think it's it's a it's something that's common to all all the literacies isn't it it's that you're not necessarily trying to create a new literacy which is bigger than the other ones it's the, it's the debate which goes all the time it's yeah. trying to build the bridges between different groups who are already doing things that are in support of sort of not falling into the traps of people just need to know x y and z and then everything would be better but they need to actually reflect the needs of different communities yeah and can i just pick up on the thing about the contested space as well because i think that for me is it, it's it, it, it one of the i think one of the things that when you want when you talk to people about copyright is they'll often say well, what are the rules? Just explain it to me. And, you know, it's, it is much more similar to aspects of information literacy where, you know, maybe there aren't necessarily right and wrong answers. And, you know, I mean, you know, I think of maybe when you teach about plagiarism, there are some quite clear things that you say you don't do this, you know, but you know in in lots of other areas where your people are doing learning to how to do research and use information sources there's there's a whole variety of ways that you can do things and a lot of what you're trying to develop is people's critical abilities to you know be a lifelong learner and to make decisions themselves and i think that's where it's really it's a bit of a shift if you if you see copyright just as somebody comes to you saying can i do this yes no and you act as a gatekeeper, then you're kind of never really helping them um, become self-sufficient and understand enough about it. And, and so even though there is a little bit of what I think, I mean, librarians want to do it, but any teacher wants to, in some ways, you know, you want, you don't want, you don't want people to feel confused. You want to sort of explain a body of knowledge in a way that is clear. You want it to appear, you know, that there is, there is some kind of rule. There are theories, there are mm. sort of things that, that should and shouldn't be done, particularly when you're teaching the sort of more practical subject. Um, but I think, you know, we sort of have to expose the tensions that exist in any difficult subject mm. you know you 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 can't just sort of say well you know this is the law and this is what it says therefore this is what you should do um i think you you have to address the fact that for many people the way that the, the, copyright doesn't make a huge amount of sense to them because it's become so big and all encompassing and it affects many aspects of their life in ways that don't necessarily always you know, align with, I kind of got a photo, I want to share it, I want to do this, I want to do that. So, you know, exposing the tensions is actually, I think, a really important part of copyright education and exposing the fact that there are different views about what copyrights even, you know, it, what what is it meant to, I always say to people, copyright is not, you know, it's it's not like a, it's not like gravity, it's not a sort of, you know, it, it, it was created by humans and it works in different ways. And given that it was created in a particular way, we have to think about who created it and what purpose it was created to serve and whether that is relevant and to question that. So that's quite a long winded answer. But I think <laughs> I think I think it being a contested space is actually, you know, is means it's an exciting place for teaching as well. Absolutely. And uh, picking up on, on this idea of multiple literacies, you mentioned um, in your chapter, uh, chapter um, 
Mm. I, I think, uh, my opinion, in my opinion, you present a very balanced perspective of the information digital and media literacy. Um, mm. In other forms, you can see, or it's very common to see, an acclamation of the ven benefits of such literacies without mentioning the perils. And I know uh, this word is not probably <laughs> well accepted, but my, my, my point is that if you think about people spreading misinformation or uh, using uh, copyright in a different way, it might be because they they have actually very good communication skills and they are um, literate. My point is, should the ethical aspect be at the center of the process in all these literacies? Mm. We, I mean, we have a definition of copyright literacy that that specifically mentions ethical mm. um, and we we have talked about that and reflected on it um, because it doesn't say promote the legal sharing or use of and it's not that we're not saying that people should you know <laughs> not act lawfully no um, and certainly if we're being asked in a professional capacity to provide advice to people around copyright I'm sure my employers would say, well, absolutely, they're they're employing me to help um, our colleagues remain lawful. But I think I think it relates back to the to this idea of the contested space, the fact that laws are created by human beings and that laws are constantly negotiated and that the law is a conversation mm. and that new cases can come along, new laws come along new new uh disputes around the boundaries of the law come along and they can shift and they can change um so the ethics really does have to be at the heart of it because surely that's what's driving that's why we have a law that regulates the creation and, and communication and dissemination of creative works because we want it to provide the best society and the best culture um, and environment for us all to live in um, but it's a balancing act, isn't it? And it's, mm. you know, when you're thinking about ethics, it's kind of, well, who, you know, who says it is a little bit like that piece of copyright news um, that we were talking about um, from Finland, where, you know, you sort of have to say, well, well, what's the most important thing here? Is it about access to education and science and culture? Is that the greater good or is it about rewarding and incentivizing, you know, the, the kind of whole sort of uh, labor theory around what what copyright is meant mm. to do? Um, and yeah, I, th I think I mean, we had we also one of the things that, you know, when we were at the create conference, um, the evidence conference in back in September in, yeah. in Glasgow, they talked about you know looking at some of the 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 sort of um the messaging that underpins copyright so that one about you know if you didn't have copyright people wouldn't be incentivized to create and and actually a lot of the evidence suggests that's not true at all people you know there's an innate sort of thing in many people that they want to create and we know also and you could then say oh yeah well people should be able to make a living but again another create study shows yes but a lot of people can't make a living out of the majority of people do their creativity even if they do it all the time. no so while there is a lot of money that's made a lot of that money doesn't actually go back to the you know the, the author or the artist and and things like that so yeah i mean ethics of course is really important but it's whose ethics isn't it and what what are we saying ultimately is the most important thing? And do we prioritize the sort of public interest? Which is why the critical element that we bring out here is a key one, because that's mm. about looking at the power structures involved. So if you're having a discussion about ethics, if there is a particular group voice, which is has more power than others, then their view of what is ethical um, can then, and has, as we've seen, dominate that debate. So we think it's, yeah, it is at the centre of, I think, what we're talking about here, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that was my my next topic, actually, the the critical aspect, because uh, in your chapter uh, chapter you talk a lot about being critical or even critical pedagogies, for instance. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, this seems to be at the centre of the the different multi uh, literacies you mentioned. Um, and actually, you, you say something that's interesting. 
you, you, you mentioned critical rather than functional role within the digital literacy context. Uh, yeah. Criticality is really at the center. I was just thinking if you could go back to your case studies, um, one from University of Kent and City University, and if you could be critical of your own uh, role within the case studies you shared with us in the chapter. So something that went really well and surprised you uh, and other things that you find really challenging uh, in terms of implementing copyright education. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great thing to think about. So if, if I think about the process of developing the, the strategy with colleagues, um, I mean, it, it was quite a, a challenging thing to do, but I think it was, it was valuable to actually put myself under that critical, to be subject to that critical thinking, um, because all the time about what we believe copyright is, copyright mm. literacy is, mm. and how it works in practice. Um, but then when I was running the idea past colleagues and getting thoughts about, for example, risk management, the idea that copyright is all about risk mm. um, and that therefore it's necessary to take risks sometimes in order to avoid undermining your educational or, or research mission. Um, and a colleague pointed out, well, risk is very different for a tenured uh, middle-aged white professor than it is from uh, for a student or an early career researcher from a non-traditional background who certainly does not come to academia with a feeling that the system has their back, you know. Mm. And, and, and so that was an interesting one where I, I think I felt at the time sort of a bit on a mission to say, right, we should be bold and we should not let copyright stop us doing the things that we want to. Um, and, and then it became very clear that the reason why it was important to, to do this work and why it was a valuable thing to do is not because it wasn't I wasn't riding in like the savior on the, on, <laughs> on the horse to say hey copyright literacy has come to save the day it's like no we need it because there are fundamental inequalities it's you know it's not the biggest one there are many many other things that cause the issue but there are elements of this that are uh, you know come right through all of those hierarchical structures that that we have to come across um, so I think for me that's probably the experience that the most speaks to that critical element yeah mm -hmm. um yeah my well so my case study is about um creating the the module digital literacies and open practice that i teach um at city and um i i suppose bringing the kind of uh, it's really interesting i think teaching that module it is really difficult so it's masters um students many of whom are out you know obviously Lewis, you teach on the program, so you know the sort of audience that that we're teaching. They're from a variety of backgrounds from different disciplines, but they are mainly lecturers, um, educators, um, some of whom work in the NHS. Um, <clears throat> and they they you know, there is there has been a lot of interest in the module, which is great. Um, I. I think even in the scope of just, you know, a 15 credit module, I sometimes do think that the depth that we're, you know, we go into is it, 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 there's just not sufficient time for people to, you know, get their level of knowledge up to where it needs to be. Um, I, I find a lot of people, even when they're approaching their second assignment, are still you know, they're very hazy about what the difference is between open education and what open access is. And the other thing that they often do is they just simply equate um, the literacy side of it with those functional skills. And I think it is a problem, particularly when because of if you call it digital literacy, people think of the technology. And so that's what they focus on. And they write a lot um about the the functional and they write a lot less about the critical and you know i have to really push them to 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 try to do that um and i'm i'm you know i'm always i mean i, I do feel 
you know, I've had several people. So on, on the exciting side of things, I've had several people who, you know, I'm not saying coming on the module changed their life, but it certainly really did seem to change their way of thinking about a lot of things. Uh, uh, several people have said to me that they just were so <coughs> sorry. I just have a glass of water. They were just so sort of almost shocked about some of the things about how academic publishing worked that they just hadn't thought about before, particularly like people who work in the NHS and they start to sort of, and I, I realise actually that several of the students, um, you know, they've, they've maybe had experience where they studied overseas <coughs> and then they start to reflect on the fact that actually they didn't have access to lots of the literature and that causes lots of inequalities. So, you know, I think there's, it, it's really difficult to teach. I could really do with more time with them, but I, I do think it's having a big impact. Most teachers would say the same thing, <laughs> yes. wouldn't they? Uh, I, I, I think this is a really uh, interesting because you have not only the, the theory, but also the experience in leading and uh, working with uh, colleagues. And uh, thinking about, um, 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 a specific group uh, you mentioned not in this um, in this part of, of the conversation but previously you reflect on the role of, of the that lib libraries and librarians play in addressing uh, copyright issues and um, I'm just wondering in your vision what might be the role played by librarians in developing those critical approaches to, to copyright um, if you can give some examples um, from what you know, because I know you work quite a lot with uh, uh, librarians. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I'm thinking back to an event that um, the Information Literacy Group uh, organised. It was back in 2019, I think. We got together in Liverpool. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it was looking at the, um, the, the sort of movement of open access. Open access is clearly a big thing in librarianship. Um, and information literacy um, been established for many decades now um, as something which is key to to what particularly academic um, librarians uh, do with with students um, mm. in a higher education context. Uh, and it was really interesting to see some some examples of of how that was actually being done. So in when teaching how students would undergo um, how would they do research? Where would they find material? And actually drawing, showing them, and it's similar to what you do really in, in, in your module um, on digital literacies and open practice. But Manchester, for example, were working with undergraduate students and pointing out um, differences between open and uh, openly accessible material and, and, and material behind a paywall and actually using the, that that whole openness uh, debate as to 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 research into and to try and find some literature. So there's a key example mm. there of how you know it comes together. Mm. Um, Edinburgh also do a lot mm. with uh, the um, you know OERs and getting students involved yeah. in uh, creating OERs, remixing, reusing Charlie mm. Carly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> does a lot of work in that area so yeah I think I think there are things definitely and there are there's many other examples I think from, from other institutions as well um I mean we 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 try to do it I don't know whether we we are we librarians anymore I think we we we, we are really aren't we kind of at heart, at heart of course, yeah. <laughs> but I think for, for, for those who you know for, for people in a kind of academic uh, librarian position whose responsibility is to do um, information literacy teaching. We see it all the time. It's a question that's there. It's it's at the heart of uh, librarianship. Yeah, um, there's a lot, and there's a lot of work I think being done to use approaches from critical pedagogy. And I think we one thing we got actually through the peer review process as well. Um, some some pointing towards what's happened in the US, mm -hmm. um, and in fact, y y American institutions have been um taking a, a slightly more uh sort of uh, confident and proactive approach to teaching copyright and those elements of it for mm. some time so that there are there, it's more of a tradition that's been established where american universities have invested in copyright 
people, copyright officers, some of whom are more like to be trained lawyers. And here's, here's Pickle. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, She's and, just come to read the chapter. And, and, yes. And, and, and the development of scholarly communications offices where they have brought those things together an awful lot. So there's um, and, and let you know, Carl Courtney, a guest of, of this uh, webinar multiple times and his copyright first responders program is a, is a key example of how he's been uh, training up librarians to mm. to understand about copy understand the critical elements and incorporate it in what Americans would call information literacy instruction mm. brilliant mm. thank you so much my last question before we open the floor uh, okay really a quick one what will be from your point of view the the main or what are the main um, challenges in regards to copyright education um, for the next couple of years can you identify? A couple of key aspects that uh, we should look at. I'll go mm. with. I think it's it's always been there. Is that it's underlying complexity, and the well, the principles behind copyright law are not that complex, and I, most people understand them. Even if they think they don't know about copyright, they, if people mostly know that, that what it's about. Uh, but if we think of an example of what's happening in universities at the moment, um, open access and the rights retention uh, uh, strategies and policies that institutions um, are putting in place. Now, that involves uh, discussions with academics uh, about their rights and their, the way that they contract with academic publishers. Um, and it's, it, there are, different perspectives on this. Again, the contested space, academic publishers have a very different view to it, the institutions putting it in place, research funders. And that is um, a complex area to work through because there's always ways that you can criticize um, a, 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 you know, a, a new thing coming that involves copyright law because you say, well, it's far too complex and look at all of these different um, unintended consequences that might come from this particular and explaining that and talking it through with people and not losing sight of the key issues and getting lost in the detail and the, mm. and the hypotheticals uh, I, I think that's that's a key challenge yeah I, I suppose it's for, for me it's probably just um you know there's there's going to be there's there's so many other things that are really important to teach about so it's where it, it fits with all the other stuff that people are worrying about in their life and and particularly you know because there's a lot of focus on misinformation there's currently a huge concern in higher education about um, artificial intelligence and some of the tools that are out there and what that means about assessments um i i think probably the the biggest challenge will just be you know getting some air time to be able to get because i think people will say yeah 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 you know but there's lots of other bigger things that we need to worry about and you know as ever it's i think you know it is it is when you're the, the copyright specialist of course it's the most important thing but it's sort of understanding um you know that people have so many other priorities and so many other concerns and and being able to see things from those perspectives really would sort of help people i think you know when you're trying to teach copyright sort of say well how can i how can i kind of you know show that this relates to yeah it's it's not being a bigger picture exactly it's, it's to collaborate with others and not be so precious about your your part of it that yeah. you, you kind of yeah it, it's about combining all those different messages together as something that's coherent but yeah it, it's that is that's a challenge yeah yeah brilliant i think that that's really a, a good takeaway for all of us and uh, i guess we have a few minutes for questions if you have questions uh you can either use the chat box or open your mic uh, i've been doing all the questions now it's on you <laughs> and let yeah. me highlight that uh, we are almost 70 people in this session which is wow it's very good it's yeah. glad to have everyone time can i just check i mean has everybody read it have you read it yet <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 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 open access it's 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 yeah. and, and, and that was a key thing as well just to say the fact yeah. that it's open access we we wouldn't 
have put the time and effort into something i think at this stage that, that wasn't available on that basis so we made that clear yeah decision. yeah yeah we did well yeah. i guess if uh, colleagues had, and 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 have the chance to to have a look at the the chapter i think after the this uh, conversation they will be more motivated to to go through all the 34 pages it's quite a, a long chapter but very dense and uh, and uh, <laughs> it's not dense it's not dense at all it's, it's no in a, it's, it's in a positive content. way <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm aware. I, I think the other thing for me is I don't think it's the final word on the matter. <laughs> no, I think I, I did, I did kind of think, right, let's get it there. This is going to be the thing that we get to say about copyright literacy, and it's like, actually, no, it isn't. No, it's, no, it, it's, it's shifting. It's different in different contexts, and so it's a thing that, yeah. Well, I think we're and, carry and just, on, we? you know, just to sort of flag up. I mean, as well. Work. but you know I mean it is a CC by article so I think um, you know if people want to take it and adapt it and do stuff with it then they can do that as well mm. we'd obviously love to collaborate with anyone um, but you know it, it is I, I think that's the beauty of it that we put it out there and let's see where it goes yeah. and whether I, somebody Jack, wants Jack, to remix it sorry to interrupt yeah. we have a question from Susan Mayer was it difficult condensing your thoughts into the, the chapter? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, think, I think the answer is yes. It was. I, I think one yeah. of the key things that in that redrafting process that hadn't come out, in, I think you did the first draft. Yeah. Um, it was the... Put everything in but the kitchen sink, it was, didn't I? And well, I think what was it, it was a bit light on, which we which you added in there, is, is more about the illiteracy side of things. Yeah. Because I wanted to see not less about copyright, but more about the different types of literacies and, and, and what that was and what it meant to, to define something as literacy, as a, um, you know, communicative practice and mm. all of this kind of stuff. So, uh, but yes, it, I, I think the answer is, is yes, it was. I do remember also, um, a, we had a real, we went round and round the houses with, can you stop? Yeah, there was cat fur going everywhere, which is contributing to be it. coughing. As okay, well. right, I'll stop. <laughs> she likes it then. Um, no, we went round around the houses with this argument about whether copyright was a literacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because and, copyright and... is not a literacy. Copyright, no. and that's why we changed it in in the phone. Because you were saying copyright is a no, copyright is a body of law. Yeah. Copyright literacy may or may not be a thing, depending on your point of view. But information literacy is a thing. Yes. Media literacy is a thing. Digital literacy is a yes. thing. And copyright is a part of it. And I think that's kind of where we got to yeah. at the end. So we yeah. use copyright literacy as a way of thinking about copyright from a information and digital literacy perspective. Yes. And it was interesting. I think the other thing I really enjoyed doing was actually going and looking at those frameworks and kind of saying, yeah, well, it does fit in here, but mm. it is... You know, so it's kind of seeing the bigger picture. Um, thank you so much. I think that's that's and again a very good summary. And uh, uh, we have now messages people saying uh, goodbye and uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> we've uh, had enough to go. <laughs> uh, I just want to say uh, also thank you so much uh, um, to both of you, Jane and Chris. You are such a fun and prolific duo. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> for taking the time uh, to reflect on the topics uh, of the chapter with all of us. And thanks everyone for attending. And yeah, uh, to you. both of you. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Lewis. Yeah. Uh, really yeah. appreciate you taking yeah, the time. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got to go off and teach as well. So um, we, you can hand back to us if you want. Um, and uh, yes, there oh. will be a recording of this. You've got a cat on your laptop. I, I know. <laughs> I know. The cat is causing chaos down here this morning. But thank you, Lewis, for, yeah. for your great questions as well. And yeah, we will we'll be making the recording available and hopefully follow up on this further. I think we had some ideas, didn't we, for maybe developing the chapter, as I say, because of the Creative Commons license on it. So yeah. thank you. Brilliant. Right, we're going to return to just the final part of our presentation today. And just to let you know here, 
that we do have future webinars coming up so the next uh the next one is on 10th of february uh with a margarita vindish who is uh, based in zurich who is a researcher looking at copyright and artificial intelligence <laughs> hot topic hot topic we indeed. know there's been a lot of discussion around uh chat gpt yes and, and, yes and uh we'll find out what she has to say about the, the debates and the discussions in the intellectual property world around artificial intelligence yes yeah. yes yeah then the following session is going to be a closed one in march um, on yes the... 3rd of march um yes where we're looking at presenting i think some of the data that we've been analyzing from the cla license um and asking about the new cla license which starts from uh, august of yeah next so year. make a note of that date if you'd like to come along and say that'll be a closed webinar um and um we've also um got a, a session that we penciled in on the 14th of april mm -hmm. um which we would like to see if anyone would like to speak at um yes. about becoming a copyright specialist so we usually look for three people um who might be willing to talk about their their journey to becoming and it's always a brilliant session everyone we've done so specialist. far yeah to get to know each other a bit more and everyone's got a slightly different take on it and a mm. different route into to getting interested or getting press ganged into the the copyright world so if you'd like to share your thoughts your story with us please let us know yeah um, um and then the, the may session that we've just booked in yep. with uh, matt voigt's from um ifla who's their their policy advisor and specialist around copyright at ifla um that is going to be a great session so matt um is going to join us for a whole session devoted to copyright news and he does put together these fantastic um uh, sort of uh, every couple of weeks emails that go to the IFLA copyright and legal matters special interest group mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic uh, insights and we often use Matt's copyright news to look for some stories we do indeed yes. so he's so, going to come and speak to us so if around May time you're looking for a sort of briefing and an update on everything that's going on in the world of copyright and libraries and you want to get access to a free webinar um, and some insights with somebody who's been collating those then please do tune in uh, tune in in May because that's what we've got coming up with Matt. Yeah. Uh, Simon's just asked a question about Fair Dealing Week. So that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. And um, we um, Fair Dealing Week is starting on the 20th of February. So you are right that it is coming up. Um, we haven't yet got the confirmed times and dates, I think, of, of sessions, but we will put those out in an email to people who yeah. are um, on the alt call sig and they get the newsletter, um, because I think there will be a Skirl session. The Skirl, that Skirl, they haven't announced it yet, but they've been working on a programme and it looks like yet again another fantastic programme that Skirl, so that's the Scottish um, uh, Libraries uh, Copyright Group. Um, and so that's going to be a really, really good one. Um, and we will, of course, keep everybody updated. We may be. We may be running we, an event. The maybe. reason we haven't advertised anything yet is we're still in discussion with the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. So mm. watch this space. Um, but we would um, be looking, if we could, to put an event on um, at the early part of that week. But if anybody else <laughs> is interested oh, in putting on an event, and bless you, it's that cat here, <laughs> isn't it? She's gone um, now. Um, then, I'm allergic you know, to my own cat. We'll, we'll, we'll be sharing the details of that and, and how you can let the main organising uh, group know that's based in the US um, that uh, that you're putting on an event. So, yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks for the reminder, Simon. Good yeah, point. yeah, no, really good. Um, okay, right, I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,